Good evening. <coughs> I'm very honored and delighted to speak here at the world-renowned Oxford University, especially at an invitation of Oxford Union, which is even better known than the university. <laughs> <laughs> this is my fourth visit to Oxford. The first time was in 1981, during my honeymoon. <laughs> <laughs> the second time, I came here in 1992 as the vice chairman of the Mainland Affairs Council of the Republic of China ROC government in charge of cross-strait relations. The third, I came here in 2002 as the mayor of Taipei City. And now, the fourth time, I come as the former president of the ROC from 2008 to 2016. Uh, well, you know, this month, the timing of this trip is interesting. The month of October has two important historical milestones for cross-strait relations. October 1st is the National Day of the People's Republic of China, PRC, and the 70th anniversary of its founding. And October 25th is the 70th anniversary of the critical battle of Gu Tou on the island of Jinmen in Fujian province across the 90 nautical mile Taiwan Strait from Taiwan. From the 25th to 27th of October 1949, three regiments, over 9,000 troops of the People's Liberation Army, the PLA, crossed the narrow Amoy Jinmen channel to invade Jinmen. Uh, they were completely defeated in the end, had, leaving over 5,000 dead and nearly 4,000 captured. Obviously, the PLA enormously underestimated the Jinmen defenders in a totally unfamiliar, amphibious setting. Uh, measure again the other battles of the Chinese Civil War from 1946 to 1949, in which over one million troops took part the Battle of Gu Ningtou wasn't a big one, but it was the biggest failure of the PLA in, and the most important victory for the ROC since the outbreak of the Chinese Civil War. Most importantly, the battle effectively prevented the advancing PLA from taking Jinmen Island and made impossible their original plan to invade Taiwan thereafter. As a result, the subsequent 70-year division and separate rule on the two sides of the Taiwan Strait quietly took shape. The battle also taught the PLA another bitter lesson regarding amphibious warfare, which Beijing never tried again against Jinmen in the last 70 years. So when the PRC government celebrated their, ration, their national day on October the 1st, in Tiananmen Square. I was visiting Jinmen 24 days later, in October 25th, commemorating the Gu Ningtou victory, which saved not only Jinmen, but also Taiwan. At this juncture, you may want to ask me, is the Chinese Civil War finished or yet? My answer is yes and no. I will tell you why in my following <coughs> remarks. Uh, in the, well, let me first talk about, talk about the Korean War and the Cold War thereafter. The outbreak of the Korean War eight months later, on June 25th, 1950, intensified tension in East Asia. Two days later, on June 27th, U.S. President Truman ordered the Seventh Fleet to patrol the Taiwan Strait, preventing Taiwan and mainland China from attacking each other. He also declared that the determination of the future status of Formosa must await restoration of security in the Pacific, a peace settlement with Japan, or consideration by the United Nations. The declaration was intended to give the U.S. needed room to intervene if necessary. The Korean War actually forced the PRC to postpone and eventually cancel its previous plan to invade Jinmen again. 
It gave President Jiang, Jin, Jiang, Jiang Kai-shek of the ROC ample time to start political economic reforms in Taiwan by holding universal direct local elections in secret ballots beginning in October 1950. These elections were held pursuant to the new ROC constitution adopted in 1947. This move was unprecedented in nearly 5,000 years of Chinese history and provided the foundation toward Taiwan's full democratization 40 years later. Meanwhile, the land reform initiative, especially the land to the till uh, the Tillers program, effectively increased the income of tenant farmers, enhanced their incentive to work harder, encouraged the landlords to move to light industries and contribute to a more equitable distribution of wealth in Taiwan. This reform paved the way for Taiwan's rapid economic development and political reform since 1950. By the way, coincidentally, today is Chiang Kai-shek's 132nd birthday. <laughs> it, it was this man who restored Taiwan from the Japanese after World War II. He defended Taiwan against the communist invasion and developed the Republic of China to become the 15th largest exporting country in the world today. By the way, UK is the 10th largest. <laughs> so please feel, please feel relieved. <laughs> in, in, in December 1954, the ROC entered into a mutual defense treaty with the US, making the two uh, countries security allies again after a hiatus of nine years. In January 1959, the US Congress passed a joint resolution authorizing the President of the United States to employ armed forces when necessary to protect Taiwan from mainland China. Then comes the uh, Ba Er Shan uh, Pao the 1958 Formosa crisis and its impact. Nevertheless, beginning on August 23rd, 1958, more than 600 PLA artillery batteries in Amoy, Xiamen, just opposite Jinmen, started a massive bombardment of the 153 square kilometer, which is about 59 square miles, about the tenth of the size of London city, Jinmen Island. Almost half a million shells were fired. The three deputy commanders of Jinmen Defense Command were killed at dinner together on the first day. The American 7th Fleet escorted ROC naval vessels to transport the powerful 8-inch artillery to Jinmen, and a new weapon effectively silenced the PLA batteries in Amoy, Xiamen. Having failed to get an upper hand in the land, sea, and air battle, Beijing announced a ceasefire in early October. Two weeks later, U.S. Secretary of State John Foster Dallas visited Taiwan and met with President Chiang Kai-shek. They issued a joint communique on October 23rd, in which President Jiang agreed that ROC would not use force to recover the Chinese mainland, an important change of his previous position of armed invasion. Afterwards, the PLA resumed bombardment, but only on the odd number days. Dan da shuang bu da. The shielding continued for another 22 years. Over time, the content of these shells, normally high explosive, was gradually replaced by communist propaganda. So, uh, so when a shell exploded, what people saw was not just fragment of the shell, but photographs of Chairman Mao Zedong. <laughs> the 1972 U.S.-China Shanghai communique and the 1979 U.S. recognition 
U.S. recognition of the PRC. As you know, United States President Richard Nixon visited Shanghai, China, uh, and signed the Shanghai Communique on February 28, 1972, with mainland Chinese Premier Zhou Enlai. The communique acknowledged but did not recognize Beijing's position on the sovereignty of Taiwan. The armed confrontation between Beijing and Taipei soon subsided. On January 1, 1979, the U.S. formally recognized the PRC, severed diplomatic relations with the ROC, terminated the 1954 Mutual Defense Treaty with the ROC, and withdrew all American forces from Taiwan. Meanwhile, Beijing stopped all bombardment on Jinmen and called for the opening of name uh, for travel and transport across the Taiwan Strait. Meanwhile, American Congress itself proposed and passed the Taiwan Relations Act, the TRA, in March 1979 to govern the continued unofficial economic, cultural, and other relations with the U.S. with Taiwan. Under the TRA, Taiwan is treated as a foreign nation in the US, U.S. courts under U.S. law, despite the derecognition of Taiwan and the U.S. continues supplying defensive arms to Taiwan to maintain its military strength. Also, any effort to determine the future of Taiwan by non-peaceful means is considered a threat to the peace and security of Western Pacific and a matter of grave concern to the United States. The TRA indeed uh, unprecedented in world history and in international law. At the time, I was an SJD, Doctor of Judicial Science candidate at Harvard Law School, when the U.S. cut its diplomatic ties with the ROC, with Taiwan. I was very disappointed by the event, for sure. I joined many Taiwan students in public rallies in Boston, New York, and Washington to lodge our protests. It was freezing at the time, and tears on my face. One day, I came across Professor Detlef Vax, an advisor of my doctoral dissertation in the law library. He comforted me by saying that, Injo, I know how you feel these days, but you have to, got to understand that Taiwan is the most recognized, unrecognized government of the United States. I didn't laugh at the time. <laughs> this is not a joke, it's true. So, what happened after that? In 1982, Taiwan rejected the one country, two system formula for cross-strait reunification that was proposed by Deng Xiaoping, the, the, paramount, the paramount Chinese communist leader at the time. The ROC's president, Jiang Jingguo, said, that China does not need two systems, but need a good system. At the time, I was an English interpreter for President Jiang Jingguo, so I translated into English word by word. The ROC government decided in 1987 to allow the people to have family reunions with their relatives on the mainland, whom they had not seen for nearly 40 years. Cross-street relations enter into a new era with the act of uh, uh, reconciliation and the need to establish two quasi-governmental go-between organizations, namely the Strait Exchange Foundation, SEF Hai Ji Hui, representing Taiwan, and Association for Relations Across the Taiwan Strait, ARAS Hai Xie Hui, representing mainland China. These two organizations enable the two governments to handle cross-strait uh, affairs without having to go through official channels. And the two sides reached a consensus in 1992 on the One China Principle. <coughs> Whereas both sides adhere to the uh, One China Principle but have different interpretations. That means One China respective interpretations. Some have joked that the 92 consensus it's a masterpiece of ambiguity. Well, ambiguous or not, it has worked. 
and work very well. Uh, so cross relations took a big turn in 2008. When I was elected president, the 12th president of the Republic of China, and inaugurated in May. Within two months, Taiwan and mainland China, long separated by the Taiwan Strait and a bloody civil war, started the first direct scheduled commercial flights in 60 years. The number of flights jumped from zero in 2007 to 890 a week in 2009, serving 54 airports in mainland China and eight airports in Taiwan. Now, roughly nine million people travel across the Taiwan Strait every year. The two sides also signed 23 agreements during my presidency covering all walks of life. The number of mainland visitors rose from 300,000 a year to 4.2 million, up 14 times. The number of mainland students studying in Taiwan rose from 823 to 42,500, up 50 times. Officials of the two sides met regularly and called each other by their official titles. All these changes were totally unprecedented. On November the 7th, 2015, thanks to the help of the Singapore government, President Xi Jinping of mainland China and myself met in Singapore. At that meeting, we, we reaffirmed the 1992 consensus, that is one China respective interpretations as the common political foundation of cross-strait relations. And we agree to broaden and deepen cross-strait exchanges. We also agree to reduce the state of hostilities between uh, uh, us by setting up a telephone hotline to handle emergencies. This summit was called the Ma Xi meeting, Ma Xi Hui in Taiwan and Xi Ma Hui in Taiwan. <laughs> <laughs> so the Ma Xi Hui codenamed Maxim, M A X I M, and was the first of its kind in 70 years. What made Maxim special was that we agreed in advance that the formalities had to be absolutely, absolutely equal and dignified. And neither side would use its country name or official titles. Xi Jinping and I would just call each other Mr. Xi and Mr. Ma. Of course, what else can you do? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we decided uh, to hold a summit in Singapore's shangri Hotel, which side would pay for the expenses? Well, the mainland side says they would because they said they have a diplomatic relation with Singapore and we don't. <laughs> well, our side had no choice but agree with pleasure. <laughs> oh, <perfect. laughs> How about the expenses for this? small banquet after the meeting. We decided to go Dutch. <laughs> How about the beverages? Well, the men inside would bring 30-year extra old 53-proof Mao Tai liquor. <laughs> and we would bring 32-year extra old 58-proof Jinmen Gaoliang liquor. <laughs> after the meal, we found that more Gaoliang was consumed. <laughs> so Gaoliang was more popular than Mao Tai, <laughs> as usual. <laughs> what Xi Jinping and I did was to build a big, long-lasting bridge of peace and prosperity across the Taiwan Strait, open to future, future leaders uh, to follow if they follow the traffic rules. That is 92 consensus. Before the meeting, we agreed to notify the Americans simultaneously about this historic event five days in advance on November the 2nd. The U.S. greatly appreciated this move. So when the maxim ended, U.S. government agencies and congressional leaders released totally six timely statements 
over the maximum we can to strongly endorse the meeting. The economist Maxim commented on Maxim was Beijing's biggest concession to Taiwan on sovereignty issues since the 1980s. The positive American attitude was definitely reflected the U.S.-Taiwan relations. Susan Thornton, the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State of the United States State Department for East Asian and Pacific Affairs at the time, uh, also pointed out in a speech on Taiwan at the Brookings Institution in Washington, D.C. Uh, on May 6, six months before the maximum. And I quote, the U.S.-Taiwan unofficial relationship has never been better and an important ingredient of the close cooperation in recent years has been, has been the stable management of cross-street ties. End note. This is very accurate description of Taiwan-U.S. relations, which was repeated later by many ranking American officials before my presidency came to an end in May 2016. Meanwhile, the maximum became a, fr fr a frame of reference to the U.S. in President Trump's meeting with North Korean leader Kim Yit in Singapore on June 12 last year. Throughout my eight, eight years in office, Taiwan enjoyed an average trade surplus of 73.3 billion U.S. dollars each year in its trade with men in China. Over that period, our total trade in eight years uh, surplus versus the main total 590 billion US dollars. The more than 4 million mainland tourists each year visiting Taiwan also brought in a large amount of foreign exchange, which greatly benefit local businesses. The frequent people-to-people -people contact, particularly between students, gradually changed their impressions of each other and paved the way for sustainable peace and prosperity. Now, let me talk about what happened after 2016. <laughs> uh, how, uh, you know, the change of government in Taiwan in 1916 However, the handover of power from the KMT party to the Democratic Progressive Party, DPP, in May 20, 2016, changed everything. A peaceful and prosperous cross trade relations was suddenly changed to a cold peace and later cold confrontation because the pro-Taiwan independence DPP government refused to accept the 1992 consensus, one China respective interpretations which the two sides agreed in November 1992 and reiterated in Maxim in, in, our, in my meeting with uh, Mr. Xi Jinping. Beijing now saw this as a serious breach of mutual trust and therefore stopped all communications with uh, Taipei. Uh, but the DPP just doesn't care. It only acknowledges the historic act a historic fact that uh, the meeting took place in 1992, but does not accept its outcome. Offended, the mainland side thereafter reduced the number of tourists going to Taiwan, uh, seriously hurting Taiwan's tourism industry. On the diplomatic front, as far as the mainland has lured away seven diplomatic allies from Taiwan since 2016, reducing the total number of diplomatic allies from 22 to 15, the lowest since 1912 when the republic was founded. Of particular note, the, uh, the uh, mainland took away two of our South Pacific allies, the Solomon Islands and Kiribati from Taiwan within a period of five days from sept September the 16th to 20th. Many believe the harsh move of taking away two allies in five days was intended possibly to punish the DPP government for getting involved in Hong Kong's arrest and in preparation for the PRC's National Day on October the 1st. 
Beijing also forced eight of Taiwan's representative offices in non-airline countries to remove the word Taiwan or the Republic of China from the names or to move out of the capital city. More recently, as, as of August 1st, Beijing no longer allows individual mainland travelers to go to Taiwan. This restriction was further extended to group travelers later. This move is intended to show their displeasure toward the Thai government's pro-Taiwan independence policies. Meanwhile, Taiwan has not received an invitation in 2017, 2018, or 2019 to the World Health Assembly, WHA, in Geneva, the annual conference of the World Health Organization, WHO. In contrast, Taiwan attending the WHA every year from 2009 to 2016 during my presidency. In addition, Taiwan was not invited to the 2018 annual meeting of the International Civil Aviation Organization, ICAO, in Montreal, Canada, unlike the, 19, uh, the 2015 case. In addition, Taiwan Recently, mainland China has started requiring companies and airlines doing business in the mainland not to designate Taiwan as a country, but to instead call it Taiwan Common China or Chinese Taiwan or Chinese Taipei. Recently, the, deter uh, the deterioration of cross-strait relations in the last three years has hurt Taiwan's interest in many ways. Foreign, foreign relations is but one. The economy is another. Meanwhile, Beijing vigorously pursued its United Front campaign, Tongzhan, on February 28, 2018. It offered Taiwan people 31 types of preferential treatment in areas including university admission, professional licensing exam, for lawyers and medical doctors, for example, and business opportunities. Such offers are generally welcomed by the people in Taiwan, but criticized, if not resisted, by the DPP government. Less than a year later, on January 2, 2019, Xi Jinping proposed the two-system Taiwan program and called upon Taiwanese people to respond. His aim is to promote China's peaceful unification on the basis of one country, two system formula, which most people in Taiwan long ago <coughs> rejected. President Tsai Ing-wen Ing took advantage of that opportunity to erroneously equate 1992 con consensus with one country, two system, and to launch harsh rebuttals by severely criticizing Beijing. She did this with the hope of getting more support for her re-election bid less than a year away. In a word, the DPP government's cross-strait policy is in serious disarray and sacrifices the interests of the people of Taiwan in many ways. More than 50% of the people disapprove her cross-strait policy. A lot has to be changed before the DPP can formulate a peaceful and realistic mainland policy. Well, let me uh, uh, come to my uh, conclusions. What should the Republic of China, Taiwan do now? Neither Taiwan independence nor Coast Street unification is desirable or realistic at this juncture to people in Taiwan. I believe that the Republic of China should change the DPP government's misguided mainland policy or by doing the following three things to regain peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait. First of all, Taiwan must sincerely improve relations with mainland China by accepting the 1992 consensus, one China respective interpretations, to rebuild mutual trust established in 2008, but lost after DPP took power in 2016. Mutual trust. Mutual trust is absolutely required 
to restore bilateral dialogue in handling questions of travel restrictions, trade negotiations, or uh, diplomatic truths. No other country in the world can help us do this. We must work out the solution ourselves. It can be done uh, because I did it from 2008 to 2016, and it worked well <coughs> for me. Secondly, Taiwan should keep its options open on the definition, on, on the reunification question. Uh, the <coughs> Second, Taiwan should keep its option open on the reunification question. Reunification is an option not excluded by our constitution. And uh, uh, there is no, but there is no required timetable for that reunification. Most people in Taiwan prefer maintaining the status quo and are not ready to negotiate reunification issues with the Chinese mainland anytime soon, although the mainland seems to be getting impatient lately. Thirdly, Taiwan should con insist on certain re preconditions for reunification talks with the mainland when people of Taiwan are ready. Simply put, the process of negotiating reunification should be both peaceful and democratic. This means that there should be no use of force or threat to use force, and approval of Taiwan people must be obtained first. Lacking that, Taiwan should not engage the mainland on reunification talks and should keep maintaining the current peaceful development on the 92 consensus, waiting for the appropriate time. In the meantime, the two sides should continue broadening and deepening the current cross strait exchange. The people in Taiwan obviously are far more cautious now after the massive four month long anti-extradition protests against the Hong Kong authorities since June this year. But as many China experts suggest, as a matter of long-term strategy, Taiwan should never let Beijing and the mainland people feel that eventual reunification with Taiwan is absolutely impossible. Otherwise, their Taiwan policy will be much less predictable, to say the least. Merely rejecting the one country, two system may not be sufficient to solve the problem. A more innovative approach <laughs> is needed to manage the problem. Now, it's, let's come to the question I raised at the beginning of my talk. Is the Chinese Civil War finished or not? No answer depend, my answer depends on your choice. Uh, the code name of the 2015 Massive meeting I mentioned earlier in this talk, or Maxim uh, could mean two things. The first, M A X I M, could mean the first is the name of one of the best restaurants in Paris. <laughs> the other, the other M A X I M, is the machine gun invented by an inventor named Maxim in 1984. He's a Briton. And if you choose the machine gun, that means the Civil War is not finished yet. But if you choose the Paris restaurant, then the Civil War can be finished. Thank you very much. So because we're running late, we'll go right to audience questions. Please put your hand in the air, wait for a microphone to come to you, stand when you ask your question, and we'll first go over here. Please wait for the microphone to come to you. Uh, I'm a student from mainland China, and thank you for your presentation tonight. Uh, I'm a student from- uh, Louder, please, I can't hear you. Oh, sorry. I'm a student from mainland China, Ma mm. uh, My question is, is it still necessary for KMT to adhere to the 1992 consensus, the so-called One China with respective interpretations, when DPP distorts its content as One, China, one, one Country, Two Systems policy now? Because in DPP's mind, like President Tsai Ing-wen said, 
And the mainland China never admits when, chi when China with respective importations. What mainland China, what Beijing government said is they only accept when China policy. So in Tsai Ing-wen's explanation, there's never a 1992 consensus because both uh, cross straits didn't agree on one consensus. But one from Beijing is one China, but for Taiwan, for ROC, it's one China with respective interpretations. That's different. Uh, well, as I said earlier, 92 consensus is a basic political foundation between mainland China and Taiwan. And this is the only way to establish mutual trust. Mutual trust is not only important to cross-strait relations, mutual trust is important to all international relations. And the loss of mutual trust makes the situation in cross-strait relations very, very uh, difficult, if not dangerous. This is why I keep telling my uh, government, the DPP government, recognizing the 92 consensus is the first step to improve relations with the mainland. If we want to have a good relations, other countries cannot really help us. We have to do it ourselves. So this is a very important thing that our government should learn. So I, I'm no longer the president, and I hope what I said, well, the government in Taiwan will listen. I think this is probably the only way to rebuild, rebuild mutual trust between the two sides of the Taiwan Strait. We'll have another question. This time from the, uh, the individual in the third from the aisle. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming. And um, my question is regarding the passage in the Senate um, of the United States, um, I think it was yesterday, of the Taipei Act. Um, aim to enhance the diplomatic relationship between Taiwan and other countries. Um, I guess, I suppose, you know, with the implication of this act on Taiwan's autonomy and its um, impending election, what are your thoughts on the act and do you support it? Well, uh, as I pointed out during my uh, speech, we can only help ourselves, by ourselves. The Taipei Act or some other congressional enactment such as Taiwan Travel Act, it's very friendly, but it may not really bring about what they want to see. So uh, a couple of days ago, I just joked that uh, what happened by the United States Congress uh, is the FBI. What's why FBI? It's a friendly but inconsequential. <laughs> I hope we will become FAO, friendly and operative, because we do want our diplomatic allies to stay with us. But it's very important to uh, take this issue in our negotiation with men in China. For those of you who follow my policies during my term of office, I try to create a diplomatic truce between mainland China and Taiwan. So some countries, our diplomat diplomatic allies, wanted to establish ties with the mainland. My advice to them is that as long as it's uh, uh, non-official, it's all right with us. We wouldn't object that. And our cooperation efforts with them will continue. So for a diplomatic ally of Taiwan, they could actually get the best of both worlds. And this is the reason why I was able to keep the 22 diplomatic allies during my term of office. But ever since I left office and the new government that does not recognize and accept a, a 92 consensus. So diplomatic truth no longer exists. This is exactly what the vice president of Panama says. He said, I found out that diplomatic truth is no longer 
uh, in action. That is why I decided to cut off our ties with Taiwan. This is something I really uh, feel regrettable because we have had a, a good relationship with Panama for 107 years. In other words, even during the Qing Dynasty, we established the ties, and now it's gone. It's gone forever. That is why in various occasions in Taiwan, I keep uh, reminding my government, diplomatic relations is important because this is a symbol of sovereignty. I hope uh, they could uh, uh, listen to what I said right here. <laughs> Thank you. And we'll have another question, this one from the, the woman in the aisle. Thank you, President Ma. I'm Emily from Hong Kong. I'm sure you're aware that Hong Kong is uh, being rocked by um, anti-government protests for the fifth month now. Actually, we... Oh, thank you for coming over. Don't get nervous. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I just want to hear you very clearly. Yes. Um, actually, we just had a very smoky night tonight, a special Halloween, filled by tear gas. Um, the reason that sh so many uh, young people have shed their blood and tears is because um, the younger generations feel the threat from China and they want a greater freedom. So um, do you have anything to say to them? And while you advocate a closer relationship with China, there's already th this uh, saying that um, today Hong Kong, tomorrow Taiwan. How do you address this concern? Thank you. I have to say that... Can I take a picture of you close up? <laughs> Do I still have to answer your question? Please. <laughs> well, you have to understand first, Taiwan is very different from Hong Kong. Hong Kong was a colony before 1997, and they don't have, they didn't have uh, full-fledged democracy, unlike uh, whatever, what happened in Taiwan. We do have democracy, with, we have sovereignty, we have armed forces, and we have our international relations. So, today's Hong Kong could never be tomorrow's Taiwan. Uh, we hope, <coughs> we hope uh, people in Hong Kong could uh, uh, get their freedom, their democratic system, and get rid of their sense of fear. We hope people in Hong Kong uh, could also have uh, a uh, uh, freedom from fear. But on the other hand, we hope, we hope, as you just mentioned, we could, we hope our leaders could uh, uh, improve relations with mainland China and make the pressure much less for Taiwan, particularly Taiwan businessmen. Thank you for your question. This time from the individual in the blue jacket in the front row. Yeah. Thank you for being here today. Um, so as you said before, the future of Taiwan lies in the new generation. So the, the young people in Taiwan. So how should or how could the government of Taiwan um, promote more acceptance of the 1992 consensus among the young people? Uh, this is a very good question because a lot of people in Taiwan, particularly young people, do not understand what 1992 consensus is. Particularly after uh, Mr. Xi Jinping proposed that two system Taiwan on January f uh, 2nd, this month, uh, this year, uh, our government says, well, 92 consensus is one country, two system. This is totally wrong. 92 consensus is a basis of a mutual trust between mainland China and Taiwan before, before China's re reunification. And one country, two system is the formula for the two sides after reunification. These are two different things. They should not be uh, linked. Then that is why I keep telling people in Taiwan and, or elsewhere, the 92 consensus is something that we can have with enough flexibility, not only to exist, but exist 
with dignity and happiness. So, uh, but on the other hand, sometimes mass media in mainland China criticize one country to system. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, one, uh, one, one uh, uh, 92 consensus. They believe that could be a uh, excuse for people in Taiwan to, the, to uh, advocate Taiwan independence. That's not the case. Uh, when I met with Xi Jinping uh, four years ago in <coughs> Singapore, in the official meeting, I told him that, uh, Mr. Xi, in 1992, we had the consensus of one China respective interpretations, but we will not interpret our China as two Chinas, one China, one Taiwan, or Taiwan independence. Why? Because these three things are not permitted under the Constitution of the Republic of China. This is the first time a political figure from Taiwan talk about Republic of China, talk about re Constitution in front of Mr. Xi. I look at him in the eyes and he seems to understand. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is very important. You know, because one, con uh, one China respect interpretations gives the Taiwan flexibility to deal with men in China. So it is not, it is not one country, two system. It's very, very important. We have time for one final question before we conclude the event, and we'll go to the front row of the press bench over here. Yeah. yeah. Hi, President Ma. Is it working? Hi, thank you so much for your speech, and you're my mom's favorite politician. And uh, <laughs> I have a less serious question, that is, what do you think of um, President Tsai Ing-wen's smuggling scandal of right now? The what? Uh, the smuggling scandal. Oh, you mean the cigarettes? The President Tsai Ing-wen's smuggling scandal of that. Oh, that <laughs> is now being taken care of by the prosecutors, so I have no uh, uh, additional comments to make. All right, thank you so much. Sorry. Oh. And we'll go to the second row over here. Uh, sorry, parallel to. Oh. Yeah, sure. Uh, hi, President Ma. Thank you for coming. Uh, my question is more about the eco uh, economic uh, aspect. I know during your presidency, uh, presidency uh, there is an agreement called ACFA, Economic Cooperation uh, Framework Agreement, signed between Taiwan and China. And at that time, uh, the President Tsai Ing-wen uh, proposed that if she was elected as the President of Taiwan, she will promote the referendum of uh, abolition of this uh, agreement. But now she is in, in charge of the kind of Taiwan uh, era, and she, uh, her government is, seems, seems to pretty much enjoy the benefit to Taiwan. And, uh, 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 politics uh, and people are worrying about if the tension between Taiwan and mainland China become uh, more and more serious, the mainland China would cut or, abol uh, or abolish the, the ACFA. How do you, uh, what's, what's your opinion on this kind of mm -hmm. action or agreement? Thank, Thank you. you. This is a very good question. I'm sure quite a few of you, uh, of you may not understand what ACFA is. ACFA is economic cooperation, uh, framework cooperation agreement between Taiwan and Chinese mainland. It was uh, concluded in the year 2010. That covers uh, 539 items of, from Taiwan to the mainland and 267 items from mainland China to Taiwan. ECFA is very important because this is a type of free trade agreement. Although it covers only a small portion of, go of goods and services, but it's still very important to Taiwan's economy. For items covered by ECFA usually have uh, much stronger competitiveness in the trade. And certainly we want to continue to ECFA. I don't believe that President Tsai Ing wen want to abolish that. You know, that will be a serious blow to our economy. And, uh, uh, people are now talking uh, about ECFA not in the sense that, that the president wants to abolish that, 
but there is a 10-year period of that. They are afraid. They are afraid that men in China will say, well, if Taiwan does not recognize uh, a 90 consensus, then they will get rid of uh, uh, ECFA. But I don't believe men in China will do that. This is mutually beneficial. Unfortunately, that is all we have time for. Can everyone please join me in thanking President Ma?